Welcome back to the show. Glad to be here. Is Great. Brooklyn in the house? <laughs> Great to see you again. And let me start by saying this. I, I have been in many a movie theater. I uh, have watched many movies, Spike Lee. And I will tell you this. I have never experienced what I experienced watching this movie. I watched this movie in Connecticut this weekend. And the cinema was completely filled with old white people, the area I was in. It was Mystic Lake or something like that, right? And the movie plays end to end, I think two hours and eight minutes. And we sit there and nobody gets up. Like credits start rolling, nobody moves. And then I stood up and we're like in the middle. And then all the white people around me were just like, yeah, yeah, you just keep... <laughs> And then, like, even when we were walking out, people were just like, yeah, no, you first, you first. Like, <laughs> everyone... It's, it's, a, it's a powerful film. Are you feeling that in the responses I'm you get from people? I'm feeling it. I'm on Instagram, man. I got several... People telling me that they were... You know, not one or two black people in the theater. And then after the film, when the lights finally go up, the white... People who, who love the film, they were still hugging them. They're hugging the black folks in theater saying, I'm sorry, I apologize, I apologize. I never heard anything like that before in my life. It's, it's, it's a beautiful film. And, and just to those who, who don't know anything about the story, Black Klansman is, in, is inspired by the true story of Ron Stallworth, right? He's a, an African-American detective in the, the 19, first. in the 1970s. The first... Uh, in, first police officer in Colorado Springs. Right. And this is a black man who gets into a police department and... I mean, from the get-go, let's start with that part of the story. You lay out how difficult it is to play th that, 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 that role of being a black man mm -hmm. and a police officer. And this is in the 1970s, but yeah. in some ways it feels like it hasn't changed. Well, what we tried to do was, even though it takes place in the 70s, I still wanted to be contemporary. So there are many things that my co-writer, Kevin Wilmot and I, we put in so people, it would click like, you know... Right. This stuff is still happening today. And then it... I know it's, I'm not trying to spoil anything because it's out already. Right. But the, the ending that really hammers home where we are in this world today. It, it, it's, it's a story that connects with you on so many levels. So, you know, you have Adam Driver's character, right. who's a policeman who has for so long passed as white, just plain wasp white mm -hmm. in his neighborhood. And in the story, Ron Stallworth is a black man who goes undercover as a clan member, which is... I mean, the premise sounds ridiculous. If, it, if you don't tell me that it's based on a true story, I'd be like, this is the wildest thing from the imagination. That's what I thought when Jordan Peele called me. And he said... So he says to you, this is the story, and... Six words. Black man infiltrates Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> high concepts. <laughs> you can't get more high, high than that. Right, but the real Ron Stallworth, like, he, he did this. And David Duke got bamboozled by him. Yep. And... <laughs> <laughs> and what I, what I, you know what? Here's the thing. What I found fantastic about it is in your film, it illuminates the the ludicrous nature of racism because David Duke becomes friends right. with a black man because he doesn't know that he's a black man over the phone. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and you show you show that these like it's it's a human being. Like that maybe that's the biggest thing for me is how were you able to make a film where. You seem to approach it with a certain level of empathy where you don't paint these people as caricatures. You see different people in the clan. You see human beings who are doing what they believe is right to what they believe is their divine, God-given, like... Like, how do, you, how do you begin that journey when creating that character? It starts with the script. But without, I mean, without Ron's book, I mean, it's all... That's what makes it insane and is true. Right. So when Jordan Peele said... I said, it, it sounded... Automatically, I thought of a David Chappelle skit. Right, right, right. But he said, it's true. And then I read the book, and it was a great opportunity for me. Even though it took place... Even though, even though the, the story took place in the 70s, I still thought it was a great opportunity to comment on the world we live today with Agent Orange in the White House. Let me ask you this. I don't say his name. Let me, let me Shout ask... out to Buster Rhymes. That's where I got it from. <laughs> <laughs> Buster! <laughs> let, let me ask you this. Why do you think a story about the 1970s and the Klan and a black man in the police force comments on what's happening today in America? Because I, I like to say, I think one of the mistakes people are making, I feel, is that they're saying this is just an American phenomenon. 
the rise to the right, this is, this is happening globally. And with this guy in the White House, he's made it okay for these supremacists, white supremacists, to come out in the open. They, they're, they're coming from out from the rocks, and he's legitimized them. Right. And, and I wouldn't even call it a dog whistle. He's like on a bullhorn. Have you, have you seen anything like this? I mean, you've been making movies that speak to what's happening in America for a long time. Have you seen anything like this? Not in my 61 years uh, uh, on this earth. I mean, this, this, is, this is, as they say, this is bananas. This is insane, it's topsy-turvy. And what I, one, the one thing I like to say to the audience and the people watching tonight, if we don't... If what has happened the last 18 months, if that doesn't mobilize the register to vote, I don't know what will. We have to get ready for these midterms, and after that, he's, he's got to be a one-term one president. You know, we have to... <laughs> because we're going for the flim-flam, the snake oil salesman, and the okie doke and, and, and another thing, we can't get distracted by these tweets. That's like a misdirection play in football, American football. Right. And uh, we just, we know what's coming. Then we just should, should just like, and keep, keep focused what we got to do. <laughs> That's my opinion. That's what I feel. When you're making a story, about a black man who becomes the first black police officer to work in a police force. You deal with so many issues that are relatable to what's happening today. There's a powerful line in the movie where he stumbles upon a, an officer who has done something that's bad. He's a repeatedly bad offender. He's mm -hmm. killed a black kid in the story, shot him and claimed that he had a gun. And one of the other officers, who's a good guy, says to him, well, the reason we haven't outed him is because we're a family. Mm -hmm. We in the police are a family. And the blue wall of silence. Right. And, and you portray these people as being well-intentioned and flawed at the same time. Was it important Those for you... Those human beings, though. Right. right. Was it important for you to show it in that way? Because I didn't, I didn't walk away from the film going like, oh, I hate these police, but I walked away going like, I see the dilemma that these people are facing. I don't agree with the decision many of them are making, but was that important to you? Yes, because uh, as an artist... Just look for myself. I try to be, tell the truth the best way I can, the best way I know it. And that's something I've been doing for 32 years. Right. And well, how do you think you told the truth when it, came to the, when it came to these police officers? That no one's black or white. There's, there's, there's shades of gray. And people do things for different reasons. And so I, I really... What I like to do in my films is show repercussions of decisions people make. Right. That's the interesting thing for me. You go here, you go here, and there's gonna be repercussion here, repercussion this way. You have a scene in the movie where Harry Belafonte is on screen. Give it up. <laughs> and... Honestly... 91 years old. Honestly, one of the most powerful moments in cinema. He's on the screen, and you can feel Everyone in that cinema, you can feel the goosebumps as he tells a tale. Recounting a lynching. Recounting Jesse, a lynching. Uh, uh, a real lynching. Took Jesse Washington, Waco, Texas, I think 1915 or 16. Right. And his character was his friend who hid and saw this lynching. When you are making a movie and you're telling that story, how hard is it for you to not, like, skew the way you tell the story to make the bad guys seem even badder than, than, than they were in the film? Like, how do you... Just, just tell the truth. And I just like to say, because I remember it, that scene, we shot Mr. B, Harry Belafonte, it was the last day of the shoot. And so no one knew who was going to play this role. I kept it on a low low. But I told everybody in the crew, when you come to work that day, the last day to shoot, wear suit and tie. Ladies, we were clean, because he deserved that. Right. We walked on the set, we were sharp. We had to give him his respect. Freedom fighter, with Dr. King, all throughout, always the freedom fighter, and we had to, we had to give him love. 
Everybody was dressed to the nines. Before I let you go, um, the film ends, and I won't, I won't spoil the ending of the film for you, but the film yeah, ends... Yeah, go ahead. Beep has been... Well, I want, not, the, not the ending, because I, I still want people to enjoy it. This, this is a magical ending. It's a beautiful film. Um, but what happens post the movie part is we get thrust into modern day. We go from the 1970s to 2017. We go to a Charlottesville... We go to what? a year ago what happened, a year ago yesterday. Right. And... Again, I could feel an audience that was taken from a world of make-believe, which was real, to, like, very much what you don't want to believe is real. Right. When you were putting that on screen, when did you make that decision? Because this movie you, you had been creating, when did you make the decision to put current-day Charlottesville into a 1970s film about the Klan? Well, we didn't start shooting to the fall. So I was in my summer home of Mother's Vineyard, and... It hit me just like that. This has to be the ending. But I got Susan Burrell's number, the mother of uh, Heather Hare, who was murdered, and I got her blessing, so she gave me the permission to uh, use uh, her, her daughter's photo at the right. end. So that was a year ago yesterday. She was murdered, and it was nothing but Trevor. It was nothing but American homegrown act of terrorism. When that car drove down that crowded street, and and, and murdered her, is it, it, is that's a fact. And the president of the United States had an opportunity to tell the world that we are not for hate, and he did not denounce the Klan, the alt right, the KKK. He didn't do it. And a lot of times, for me, I, I found, like, you know, he'll say something, and then they pull him on the back and say, you got to change it. Then he says, you know, he... But what I feel, whatever comes out of his mouth the first time, that's the truth, and that's, that's what's in his heart. I just want to say thank you for making an amazing film. Thank, thank, thank you so you. much for being on the show. Black Klansman is in theaters now. You want to watch this movie? Spike Lee, everybody.